So, when a natural hush falls over the crowd, <laughs> never waste that opportunity. So, welcome everyone. My name is Brayden, and I'm the director here at the News Legulative Museum Douglas Family Arts Center. And I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight to hear Kenny Seabrook talk about make believe what we see versus what we know. So, I think we're going to have our, our minds expanded tonight, and uh, certainly. <laughs> Uh, I've had a bit of a preview with this just as we were setting it up, and uh, I think we're in for a treat. So, welcome, and uh, certainly uh, we do have hearing assist devices as well. If anyone else needs one, that's not a problem. Otherwise, without any further ado, we will hand over to Kenny Burke. Thanks everyone. Welcome to the Summer Speaker Series here at the Muse. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about things that I love to talk about. And I'm happy to have a soapbox. It's great. Uh, I'd like to talk about the dialogue and the disparity between what we see and what we know, and the wonderful way that artists manipulate our vision and our mind. Seeing the world seems like such a passive thing. You open your eyes and the world appears arrayed before you. Light bouncing off surfaces and various frequencies and entering our pupil to be received by our retina. It happens. We don't have to think about it. I think this is just receiving information. I would challenge you that this is not seeing, not truly. In most of our day-to-day -day lives, we don't truly actively see. There's so much information offered to us when we do the world that our brain can't compute it. So it makes choices about the information it receives and how it's interpreted and retained. A skill particular to artists is active seeing. They can at will override the brain's impulse to check in or to check to chuck out the information that it deems unimportant. They really notice the nuance of what's going on in the visual world and they let it exist at least for a while in their visual memory. It is not an exceptional gift. It is a learnable skill that is accessible to everyone. Learning to draw is not really about manual dexterity and manual skills. If you can hold a pen and write your name, you can draw. The trick largely is an act of seeing. And if your artistic mode is realism or depicting things that look like things, the trick is also in perception and to discern what you are seeing from what you believe you are seeing. We must learn to see before we can learn to draw. First, we draw things that look like things, and then we can draw the things of our imagination. This opening image, Hands Drawing by M.C. Escher, was my gateway drug to artwork. I don't remember if it was Mr. Rogers or Mrs. Blythe who showed us this in class first, um, but a shout out to both those individuals. A shout out to Pippi, a shout out to Irene, and all the art educators um, that we know and love. This is a lithograph that's made in 1948, and it's typical of Escher's work, which is rich in illusion, melding the natural world with math, geometry, tessellation, and the fantastical in an imaginative and convincing way. I saw this for the first time, I was like, wow, this. I wanna do this. The drawing was so believable. The shading and modeling of the hand, the depiction of the line drawing, it was impossible, an illusion, and yet it's so believable. The fact that Escher can convince the viewer to accept this image as believable is amazing. In fact, it takes an incredible intellectual leap for us as viewers to understand a flat work on paper or canvas or a screen as a three-dimensional form. It's flat. We know it is. But here we have this believable three-dimensional image. We can suspend our knowledge of its flatness and see this hand as three-dimensional. It takes another different form of cognitive mind bending to translate a three-dimensional form, my hand, into two dimensions and then make it believable as three dimensions. 
even if the artist is not trying to be smart about the depiction of spatial reality, and Escher almost always is, even if we're talking about the most mundane rendering of a thing that looks like a thing, how do they do it? How do we understand it? Uh, now it is possible to take a photograph uh, and work from photographs. It takes the mental work out of translating 3D into a flat surface. Escher's work leads you down a path. His rendering ability is exquisite, and he uses it to make you believe all kinds of things. Consider ascending and descending from 1960. Exquisitely rendered castle. A complicated perspective drawing rich in architectural detail. And yet the staircase, the infinite up and down loop. What's up? What's down? What's wrong here? Isn't this world perfectly manipulated? Wonky perspective. A very early example of this kind of visual trickery is William Hogarth's satire and false perspective engraving of 1754. A surface scan of this piece yields a believable scene of denizens of a small town going about their business. When you take a second look though, Hogarth is fooling us. Wonky perspective, both linear and the way objects overlap in space. Every building has varying perspectives and often multiple competing vanishing points. Hogarth is very aware of the capacity of an artist to create visual trickery. The picture making is a powerful tool that the viewer should be aware of. Scrutinize, really look, lest you be fooled. Generally speaking, an artist uses the element of elements of design to cobble together their artwork. When I first learned the elements of design, they were line, shape, color, texture, value, form, and space. Some people also add time, scale, and typography to talk about new media or installation pieces. Having terminology and language to describe artwork is important, and so is practicing it. Practicing talking about art, how it is constructed, colors, visual devices. Adding language and conversation to the visual experience of artwork enhances it and enhances our perceptions. I'm going to circle back to that later, so bookmark it in your mind. Of these elements of design, the most basic mark that you can do is a dot. A bunch of dots strung together becomes a line. A line is a very basic, descriptive tool that an artist can wield. With it, an artist can convey quite a lot. Movement, speed, energy. It can be used to outline things, describe edges, create patterns and textures. It can be used to very accurately describe a subject. Consider the eloquent use of line in this Egon Shield drawing. A few spare lines describe this woman's form. There's very little information here. The lines are fluid and confident and applied quickly. This drawing was likely executed in only a minute or so, and I mean a minute, 60 seconds. And yet, there's enough information here for us to understand this form. The artist uses line to describe the edges of the form and some of the main lines in the drapery and stockings, and that's all. In art school or figure drawing classes, a lot of the time is spent on gesture drawing or speed drawing, which is time drawing drills. Five minutes, two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds. It is used to create muscle memory and quick translation between what you see and what you execute. The practice enables the artist to bypass the overthinking, overanalyzing, overcritical part of your brain. Drawing what we see and not what we think we see. And it's magical. With time and practice, we can express lines with confidence and accuracy, if only we bypass our brain a bit. So while the artist tries to outwit their brain, the viewer's brain fills in information that may not be there. It really wants to recognize something in that tangle of lines. On the receiving end, the viewer fills in these blanks to understand these things. Something with so little information, it aggregates our memories, 
and our knowledge of similar images to help us understand it. <laughs> Consider the devil's tuning fork illusion. It's a simple line drawing, just lines on a flat surface, yet it's confounding. Can you feel your mind trying to see a three-dimensional form here? But it's an impossible form and we're confounded. It consistently flattens and pops up again. Your perception and your intellect are clashing here, trying to understand this and make it right in your mind. In the illusion, we look to find the edges to understand the shape, and we find some missing. We really want to see them, and in fact, we intuit them, but when we look to the proof of our intuition, it is not there. All of this brain bending in just a few lines. This image of Igor Stravinsky is by Pablo Picasso, and it similarly is very spare offering us very little information, yet it's totally understandable and an accurate and recognizable likeness, okay? I show this piece because it's used in the book Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards, which was an extremely popular and influential drawing manual first published in 1979. It applies neuropsychological principles to teaching drawing skills. The particular exercise that I'm citing asks students to copy this drawing by Picasso, but to do it upside down, uh, which is not the artist being upside down, but the picture being upside down. Um, in doing so, it reduces the legibility of the image and forces the artist to access the visual and spatial functions located in the right hemisphere of the brain and bypass the analytical and sequential functions of the left side of the brain, which for many of us in this culture predominate. Basically, learning to draw is learning to access this part of your brain at will. In doing so, it unlocks different ways to think creatively and to solve problems. It is breaking down what we think we see, which is different from what we actually see. This inverted image baffles us. It makes it more difficult to put the pieces together and we have to consider each line or component in relation to the other on the page and not in relation to a human form. What we expect to see, um, or what we expect to see, sorry. We're tricking our brain, stopping it from filling in the blanks. Often beginning artists do weird things when presented a figure to draw, like putting the eye at the top of the head like an alligator. You hear you little kids and beginning artists, they put the eyes right here. Maybe because eyes are important and the crown of the head is less so. In reality, eyes in the context of the human body are located smack in the middle of your face. We look at ourselves in the mirror every day. We see people all around us. Why, when we learn to draw, do we place the eyes at the top of the head? <laughs> Kids do it, adults do it, our perception is not reliable. Exercises like this help break down those ingrained habits of perception. So line, as a basic element of design, is very powerful. It can suggest a lot of things. You can use it um, to readily identify a person or thing, but on its own, it's limited in its ability to describe the illusion of space. By itself, it describes symbols of things, symbol for person, symbol for tree, convincing symbols, but often not convincing enough for us to suspend our belief that we are looking at a flat surface. The artist needs to use value, a term to describe the lightness or darkness of what is depicted. You might also use the term shading. It is the shading that gives a drawing or a painting the structure and the ability to describe form and illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. It is a way of describing how light and shadow work on the three-dimensional form. <clears throat> A basic exercise in beginning art students is to create a chart of values from light to the very darkest dark your drawing tool will allow. It helps to visualize the gradation and how much variation you can make. Next, we practice drawing simple shapes that are lit. We learn about how light and shadow work to describe a three-dimensional object in space. I use this exercise in an adult drawing class to understand and practice shading. 
and then I use it later to learn color blending and relationships between color and value. Um, we did this in an adult drawing course. Everyone traced circles and practiced shading an orb with different points of light, and then later used color gradation. It was a very gratifying lesson because it takes a beginner from almost zero to making a convincing dimensional orb. Most people are successfully able to make a believable orb in a try or two. At the end of class, I taped the pictures up in the studio, and when the kids from the after school class came in, they wanted to learn how to do it too. They saw the visual illusion and were interested by it and compelled. It was attractive because they were convincing and the kids were eager to try. So we did. I had something that I thought was far more fun and messy plan for them. I'm liberal with glitter and glue here, but I aim to please. So I scrapped my planned lesson and took these grade three and four kids through this exercise and their floating orbs were just as good as the adult ones. So it's not hard to do. And once you get some circles done and maybe some cubes, you get the understanding of how an object exists in space and casts shadows based on its light source. And you can extrapolate your understanding to a head or a chair or a tree. You can see it and understand it in the world around you. Understanding of value and how it structures our visual world is important. But again, our brains will trick us. Our brains like to understand things by comparison. Often it extrapolates things from other information because it's easier than noticing the actual information presented. Consider this illusion by Edward H. Elson. He's a professor, professor of vision science at MIT. There's a number of illusions that challenge your perception of value by Dr. Adelson, and you should check them out on his website. In the checker shadow illusion, you see a green cylindrical form casting a shadow over the checkerboard, or the check label, label B. Your mind wants you to think that it is lighter than the check labeled A. So many things are cueing you to believe this, mostly the pattern of the checkerboard. A is in the pattern of dark checks, and B is in the pattern of light checks. So B is lighter. Logically, this should be true. And we look, if we took the cast shadow away, it probably would be, but it is not. We want to believe that B is lighter, but it is the same. Here's an illustration of the proof. You're getting the right information translated into your eyeball, but your brain is playing fast and loose with the interpretation of the information. Similarly, the chess piece illusion. Okay, chess piece illusion. At first glance, we are presented with two sets of the chess pieces, a black set and a white. In reality, the chess pieces are the same shade and only the background has changed. To verify this illusion, you can try covering the horizontal line with your finger and giving it a bit of a squint. <laughs> so as art, an artist, the challenge here is to not be fooled, or at least be able to eventually discern what is correct. It also shows a bias in how people generally see, so that can be exploited perhaps in your art making, consciously or unconsciously. Professor Adelson is able to scientifically quantify and break down how our brain processes light. It's all very interesting and over my head. Um, this, this person also fabricated a robot that creates images based on touch. So science is weird and scientists are creative people. Anyway. So we can be fooled by variations of light and shade and we can really be fooled by color. I think of color as the most complex and nuanced element of design and it is one that really exhibits how variable our perception is person to person, how malleable the visual experience is. I have seen this with customers too. I used to do custom picture framing and I would supply an array of matte samples to matte artwork. 
If we are working with trying to match a color family, I bring out a bunch of similarly colored mats. Fairly often, a customer would say, aren't those the same color? No. No, I can assure you that they are not. So we absolutely do not see the same person to person, sometimes due to physiology, color blindness, vision problems, sometimes due to our socialization, and I would argue also due to teaching and to practice. I read an article from Business Insider, and it broke my brain. It was about how nobody could describe the color blue until modern times by Kevin Loria. I haven't decided how much of it I believe yet, uh, but I've read it and referred to it numerous times over the years because it tickles my brain. The article's position is that ancient text, including the Odyssey, the ancient Hebrew Bible, the Koran, Icelandic sagas, ancient Korean and Chinese stories do not cite the color blue. The storytelling in these texts is often very descriptive and beautiful, but color references are few. Most of the references are to black and white. He quantifies the Odyssey as having black mentioned almost 200 times and white about 100. Other colors follow with red at about 15 and yellow and green at less than 10. There is not even a word for blue in the time of Homer. Apparently, that was common across all cultures at that time in the world. As language developed, and this development is common across all cultures, is that the words for black and white or dark and light emerge first. Then came red, then yellow, and green. And very last came blue. So if there was no mention of blue, were we able to see it? Physiologically, we should not have changed much as a species in that time. But the article posits that because we were not able to name and describe the phenomenon blue, it may not have been perceived in the way we do today. It was not used in conversation, so it was not important. It did not register in our mind. Our eyes could accept the color input, but our brain did not opt to analyze it. A researcher named Jules Davidoff traveled to Namibia to research the Himba people, whose language has no word for blue, but many different names for green. He did an experiment, and you can find, you can find video footage of this experiment on the YouTube. Um, by laying out many different green squares and one blue square. Few of these people could identify the blue square as different, and yet they could see more nuance and variation in green than other people. When asked the color of the sky, they would respond that it was colorless, and there's nothing wrong with their vision. It results in different ways people speak about and categorize color, and this difference in language results in differences in perception. For example, Russian speakers have a whole other word for light blue. There is blue and another category altogether called a different name, but what we might, we might term light blue in the manner that we would use the term pink to denote light red, but it's its own color category, like green or yellow. And in testing Russian speakers to sort and categorize color swatches, they do so differently than non-Russian speakers. This interests me because it suggests that our way of seeing and perceiving the world can be shaped by language and culture. And if that is the case, perhaps we can learn to see more colors, more variation in color, that our perception of color and other factors of vision can be broadened and improved. We know, for example, that the light spectrum is larger than the rainbow visible to us. Oh, wait. Yeah. Uh, but we do not have the ability to see it. Other animals can see different parts of the spectrum. For example, reptiles and birds have an additional color receptor that allows them to see wavelengths beyond human capability. Dogs and most other mammals have only two color receptors, while butterflies have five or six. The mantis shrimp has the most complicated visual system 
at 16 color receptors, the most of any animal. But its brain is so small and simple that it's not fully understood how they interpret or use that information. We humans have three receptors, red, green, and blue, which is not to be confused by primary colors and color mixing. It's totally different, totally different and it works different. Color blindness can occur when one of the cones, usually red, does not function properly. So there's this experiment that they did on colorblind monkeys, whereby they took the gene for the red cone and wrapped it in a virus and injected it into the monkey's eyeball. <laughs> After about 20 weeks, the monkeys gained the ability to see red. Apparently, this has not been performed on a human yet, but the possibility to cure colorblindness, at least this variety, exists and opens the door to speculation about our capacity to see more. As the genes for cones are passed through the X chromosome, it is possible for a woman to get two sets of cone-making genes and have four color receptors, the extra cone being yellow. They can test for this, and they found some rare examples of eight people who have it. They tested these people to see if they have any extra vision by using color samples that would not be visible to a normal vision person, but that have color frequency that a person with a yellow cone should see. Seven of eight people could not see these colors. The one that could worked in design. She worked daily with color as her profession and would have had years of professional practice to hone her ability to differentiate color. She would, have, she would be someone who used language to describe and catalog visual experiences. So perhaps had some enhanced way to view the world. It should be noted that our entire culture is geared towards RGB, or red, green, blue color perception. Our screens, everything that we produce um, is made for that type of seeing. So as I mentioned with Homeric writing, perhaps these four receptor people did not have the language or culture support to perceive their extra colors. In a world where nobody else spoke or named or categorized these color experiences, they may not have had the accessibility to perceive them, even though they may actually have the physical capacity to do so. To throw a wrench in this tangent of this story is that they then tried this experiment on an artist, a male artist who could not have the extra cone and he was able to, to discern that the color swatches were different. Crazy, right? And they also had a control group of normal people uh, who could not differentiate anything at all. What does this even mean? How do you explain that out outcome? The article did not adequately explain it to me. <laughs> but, um, we range in our ability to see and perceive uh, within and beyond our physical ability. Can we exercise this ability? Can we expand our ability? I like the idea that we can learn to see more. I know that I can see more color and more variation of color than most people. There's a variety of tests that you can take online for your color vision. Most of them are purveyors of glasses and contact lenses. Uh, but they're still fun to do. You line up squares in order of color or value, or you're asked to identify a number of, or a letter embedded in a colored field. They're fun. I always score above average. So is it a function of practice, innate ability, or how our language categorizations shape our brain activity? Was that just a natural gift, or did I learn it? Probably a bit of both. Certainly, when I used to do custom picture framing, I became very efficient at pulling out certain color mats from the mat caddy to show customers. I'd arrange the mats in order according to the color spectrum to make it easy to pull out the needed color family. 
But if the day was busy, uh, there wouldn't be time between customers to reorder the caddy. So after a few hours, they were all disordered. But I was able to fan them out and pick out exactly what I needed. I think that came with practice and with familiarity. I would even know the color name and the number I needed to order from. So I was also practicing naming and categorization. This came from months and eventually years of doing this. Certainly art and art making are a special interest of mine and I have formal art school training. Has that practice of looking at and scrutinizing artwork and practicing making color variations in my own art allowed me to learn to see more? Is it because I have practice naming these colors that it allows me to see them? Is it because I have a name for cobalt blue, French ultramarine blue, brilliant blue, Prussian blue, phthalo blue, cerulean blue, that I can tell the difference? Is it because I have learned the language that accompanies the colors? I know that my colleagues have this ability also. Would it make any difference to you to know that the color of this room is gullwing gray? If you saw it again, would you know? If I can teach you the language of color, can I teach you to see? Through language and naming and exploring and practicing speaking of art and art objects, can we expand our ability? I think we can. So as artists, when we work in color, we have so many variables to having another person understand our work. A viewer's ability to perceive color may be different based on their physiology, their culture, and their practical ability to see color nuance. Color and its perception can also be manipulated by proximity to other colors and visual forces. As in the checker shadow illusion, where your brain interferes with your perception of lightness and darkness based on its expectation and past experience, our perception of color is also comparative. Artist and art theorist and educator Josef Albers, let's look at him, very methodically explored color relationships in his work. He was the first artist ever to have a solo show at both MoMA and the Met, so he's a superstar. He is also a noted and highly influential educator. His color theory writings are required reading for anyone studying color, and his color exercises are still replicated by art students. His very famous series of paintings and prints entitled Homage to the Square was a meticulous and ongoing series of works that spanned decades, and that explored color relationships. His knowledge of color relationships is illustrated through his work, his writings, including the interaction of color, which we have in our library. And if you're an artist, you should read. I have yet to do a slideshow or talk that did not include an homage to the square iteration. Here are but two examples. His extensive body of work, writings, and teachings boils down to the fact that color is relational. It looks different and has different effect on the eye depending on what is adjacent to it and how large it is in relationship to surrounding color. A color is not a finite and constant thing. Its connotation and feeling, it evokes changes based on its situation. A green uh, compared to its complement red can look garish or jarring, while paired with a blue, it might seem cool and soothing. And how much color? The quantity matters too. Is it a huge wall-side swath of color that fills your field of vision, or a small 12 by 12 canvas? The general response to the piece will be different. There's also the disparity between actual and perceived color to be navigated. For example, we might want to depict a green apple. We know the apple is green, but in the still life, under the particular light that we have, there may be reflections on the surface or color reflected from adjacent objects that make the apple not green. Yet your mind will fight with you. It has lived its life knowing from all kinds of contextual cues that that apple is green. It will want to depict it as green, but at that moment, it's not actually green. To be contextually true, you will have to depict it using colors that are not green. And what is right and what is true anyway? I'll give you as an example a series of haystacks by Monet. 
who really got into perceived color and did pioneering work on how situational color is. If we were asked to visualize what color hay is, we might describe it as yellow-brown. Under a specific light, it is. Monet shows us here that it is also purple or red. Whoops, where'd it go? Uh-oh, an errant slide. Sorry, an unordered slide, gosh. It might be purple <laughs> <laughs> or green or any number of colors. There we go. Uh, Monet shows us here that it's also purple or green or red, that if he was committed to depicting the hay as yellow-brown, these images would not be as naturalistic as they are. So too, learning to see color as it is and not as we expect it is a skill that enhances our perception of the world around us. It reinforces that things are not as they seem or as we believe them to be. If you had the good fortune of attending the talk by Pat Bovey about her new book, available in the guest store, she mentioned that for much of the history of Canadian art, there was no active training in landscape in our art academies, even though landscape seems to be a core theme in our national art and identity. She indicated that the Royal Navy offered the most comprehensive training in landscape painting. At first, this seems weird. But if you think about it, it really seems like a sharp idea to offer training like this in a military context. Of course, having images of far-flung lands being recorded by the Navy artists was information gathering and helped inform what the far reaches of the world looked like, their landscapes, their customs, their culture. But it's also constructed way of building our steam, spending time, enjoying some recreation, but learning how to draw on paint things that look like things gives real transferable skills. The skill of active seeing, of really noticing the visual information and of information retention. It is an important and light-nourishing skill that lets people unlock and utilize the full function of their mind to see nuance and to problem solve in a non-linear way. Our brain virtually checks out information that is unnecessary. Have you ever driven home from work? or anywhere that you habitually go as part of your routine, gotten to your destination, and can't remember a single thing about your trip. The whole route just evaporated from your mind. Your brain got you to your destination, hopefully safely, and now that you're there, the information from the trip is gone. It's an obstacle to our thinking too. You can study your subject, look closely at it, try to commit it to memory, turn to your easel and attempt a few brush strokes to have the energy evaporate. And back and forth we go, look at the object, paint a few strokes, look at the object, paint a few strokes, until you can train your brain to accept that input as important enough to retain for a bit. So that you can become more efficient and don't need to constantly refer to your source. You can, with practice, gain some control over the importance your mind gives to visual material. You can notice more, retain more, perceive more. So send your kids and your grandkids to the class. If you're not an artist, consider picking up a pencil once in a while. Not necessarily to become an artist or do something you might be proud enough to frame and put on the wall. I think that's a secondary function. But to expand your mind, enhance your vision and perceptual powers in a real way, to see the world more fully, more colorfully, and to be open and discerning with visual information. We sit here surrounded by an exhibition titled The Gift of Art. And it is. So is the whole breadth of activities offered here. The Gail Conant Studio is a wonderful place. Shelby, her programmer, works very hard to give kids the gift of insightful vision, the gift of a means of expressing themselves in a safe, constructive way, the gift of a space to feel safe and accepted, the gift of an opportunity to express themselves without judgment. The studio is a place where there are no marks and no performance expectations beyond respectful behavior, where I believe kids and adults who partake of programming 
have an opportunity to see, to practice seeing fully and accepting all of the breath and beauty in the world. my mind does not work that mathy way. <laughs> and yeah, it's, um, I can divorce the thing that my mind wants to do with what I see, right? Because I have that skill. So it doesn't matter what it's doing, what it is. I can see the line in the relationship. Um, and that's the trick, the drawing trick. Uh, to see that without getting sucked in. podcast, a uh, Radio Lab podcast about uh, color, and I'm just going to leave it here. Uh, so this is the article. Uh, this here podcast goes into more, and then there's TED Talks and YouTube videos and all kinds of material about this concept, and one, uh, one instance was this linguists had this idea and had a young child who was like 18 months old and did this experiment in his house. And he describes this experiment about how, you know, the child's learning how to talk and we name things. The ball is red, the car is blue, the grass is green. You know, learning colors and words. But uh, he had asked his spouse, to not say the sky is blue. Other things can be blue, but the sky is not going to be blue um, when we talk about color with, with our child. So, child grows up a bit, and, we're, and they're naming things. Out in the park on a sunny day, the sky is blue. And he asks his child, what color is the sky? And she didn't answer. And then he kept asking this question in context. And he got white. He got um, other colors, pink. And it took three months of asking the question before it became blue. 
It was inconsistent colors, and then it's blue, and then it's inconsistent with blue. Because if you if they if they recognize a car as blue, and like, the blue is the blue, why would they call the car blue? Because yeah, it's <laughs> weird, um, but it's apparently. And, and, no, and people don't agree. Uh, the scientists don't agree, right? They have different ideas about why. why what, what is that phenomenon? Like, do you believe it? Do you not? I don't know. Um, is that it's with this consistent categorization of things and colors. So they have not categorized blue. And like with the Himba people, who have a million different colors for green, and then they see all of this variation in green. And if you looked up this experiment, they have this wheel of green colors. And I look at it, it's like, oh, it's all the same, it's all the same. But it's not the same. They're imperceptibly, imperceptible to me, imperceptible to us. Uh, color variations, like what they're showing, but they're like, this is, this is different. Because they can see the variation, but I can't see the variation. But they have language to explain the variation and to categorize this is this green, this is this green. So like, like this is cobalt blue, this is um, so like, cerulean blue. How the Inuit describe snow? The million different colors of snow. snow. Yeah. yeah. So maybe you know, if we learn the language, we would see the nuance. It's interesting. I know, like, learning a second language, or for those here who speak more than one language, there's certain words or terms of phrase that aren't translatable, but also elicit an emotion or a concept that's just new. You, you say it, you say it in that language, it's like something that is new, that you haven't experienced or said or thought before in, in your first language. And I think it's that categorization, being able to name it somehow in a way that actually brings about a new concept, a new emotion that you just never, never seen or felt before. And interestingly, language is like a left brain process. And it's art making business that we're trying to elicit is a right brain process. And I don't know if we yeah. work together. <laughs> Yes. I've seen some of your uh, landscape or forest work. Do you create that work from an actual subject, or do you compose that in your mind? Um, I don't compose it in my mind usually. I take notes on my cell phone because that's my sketchbook now. Um, I do that, but I, I play fast and lose. And I have a story. I have a story. Uh, I sold painting to a gentleman in his lake, the forest. And uh, I use different colors for different things. And this particular forest was sort of believable in the way that when it was used, but the acts were believable. But the trees were purple. The trees were purple. And um, I sold this piece, and years, like a couple of years later, the customer was like, oh, yeah, you know that painting you sold me? Uh, you know the trees are purple? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm aware. I'm aware that the trees are purple. Is there a problem? Like, do you want to come on her? Because it's <laughs> um, No, he did not. But it had taken him. A couple of years <laughs> to notice that making purchase me had from me had purple trees and not green trees. So, you know, he's expecting to see green trees. Trees are green. I know that trees are green, but then I did not make me paint green. It's just made of trees. And uh, you just need to see this now. So, when he, oh, sorry, he, he, he could move it? Yeah, it's fine. But, but he was just flummoxed that it had not occurred to him that the trees were purple <clears throat> until now. And was like, seemed to need the verification from me that that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So when you talk about your mats and you put your mats in color, yeah. So why would my interpretation of the color be not the right one? You know what I mean? Well, like, like, like what's right, well, right? Like, but it's different, and it's not the same. We are not necessarily experiencing the world the same. So you say this matter is a seagull um, gray, and I think it's uh, you know some kind of blue gray. Yeah. Is anybody right, or are we both right? We're both right. I think we're both right. Yeah. yeah. Not that I, not that I know definitively. No. <laughs> it's, when you draw a picture, like when you paint or draw something, how do you feel about photo photography and, and drawing it? You are taking pictures of the Lake of Luz and then you are drawing it. Yeah, so um, what is your I, can do, I can do both things, uh, but I am one lazy and uh, two don't have a lot of time. So for me to go with my sketchbook like Walter Phillips and sketch all the things, I'm gonna sketch this tree, it pleases me, and then I'm gonna, I don't have time for it. I don't have time for it. Uh, I'm gonna go on my canoe trip and I would like that tree. Click, oh, water lilies, I like those. And click, and I have this whole catalog of things. And um, yes, it does do the, the mental thing of flattening a three-dimensional thing. Um, I don't require that from my tool, but I do require my time back. And um, I can go out on a boat trip and take 500 pictures. It's not that I'm bad, I'm not a great photographer or anything, but with the 500 photographs that I take in an afternoon, I can generate like 50 paintings, you know? Or I can sit there and draw three sketches to take back and make into painting. It's just a better use of my time. Sometimes you don't feel like I'm when I take snapshots. And I feel like I can't capture the, the real beauty that I'm seeing. I'm enjoying them. That feeling I can share with my mom. My mom lives far away from here. Thousands and thousands of miles across from here. So I, I try to stay, but I can't. But do you feel that you, you can take that feeling in your pictures? And yeah, I can't do that because I am not a good photographer, have not bothered to learn photography, and just, I make stuff up, you know, when I make the terms and that makes, make it different, and that's, that's fine. But you can learn photography too. Um, people make wonderful photo photographs that are artistic and that bring everything to life because they know how to use their tool. I don't really know how to use the tool. Um, and know how to frame frame their photograph and like zoom in and do all of those things. So somebody could teach you, it's not me, but uh, you can definitely learn how to use your tool better and um, you know make your, your pictures better. Do you often feel that you could not, I mean, when you, when you, when you do something, Artworks like a sex fiction, a sex fiction about having all your emotion and, and feeling to be in your work. Oh, yeah, sometimes I'm just dis dissatisfied with my work. You know, that's not just me over at the same time or putting a closet out on the way back. I don't look at it anymore. I mean, these are, these are silly questions, but I, I feel like these kinds of feelings you also have, right? That, uh, Oh, I was feeling like this, and I could not, or I want this to say something. Like the pictures, I mean, have no language, but it's have languages. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you start out with um, sort of preconceived intention? Oh, I have intention. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Realize, and sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I go off in another direction. Yeah. Because, mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just get in the 
the squirrel. Yes. And then happily seduced to other things and contests and then I start with it. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, very interesting uh, discussion. Very interesting talk, certainly. And uh, now we can all go and um, see if we can see blue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's really neat. I, I was not aware of that. Um, but uh, very cool stuff. So uh, next week. We'll be back here for the finale of the Tuesday Night Speaker Series. Uh, Susan Bowman will be talking about Oliver Ellison, uh, the artist who is responsible for this glass sphere, and uh, many other very interesting pieces of work. And I am certainly looking forward to learning more about him. And uh, he's done a lot of really interesting artwork and uh, philanthropy and all sorts of really neat stuff. So next week, Seven o'clock, uh, Susan Bowman will be telling us about, uh, about Oliver Elias. So, we certainly hope to see you again. And uh, until next time, let's give Tammy one more round of applause. Thank you. So, I, I've been noticing a lot of people have been taking pictures of the screen. That's a great idea. Uh, and certainly, uh, feel free to make a little bit if you have any more questions, Tammy's here. And uh, thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.